I regretfully forgot my wallet again, so I asked if my friend could cover the bill. When my niece's school had an extended break, it became a routine for my single mother's sister-in-law and her daughter to stay at our house. Initially, I sympathized with her situation and believed in helping out, but over time, she began taking it for granted. One day, she insisted on going to a new outlet mall nearby, and reluctantly, I agreed. However, she conveniently forgot her wallet and demanded that I pay, frustrating me. Despite this, I didn't want to disappoint my sweet niece, who often went without due to their circumstances. Reluctantly, I covered the cost, insisting my sister-in-law repay me. Unfortunately, it didn't end there. On another occasion, my sister-in-law demanded another trip to the outlet mall, and this time, I was determined not to give in. My husband and I, in our thirties and married for five years without children, had discussed the possibility of infertility and decided to let things happen naturally. Our parents were supportive, understanding that not every couple follows the same path. Though still hopeful for children, we were planning our future without excluding the possibility of living without them. My younger brother, still single, once joked about having lots of kids for my share, seemingly unaware of our fertility discussions. Meanwhile, my husband's older sister, the sister-in-law in this story, was a single mother who regularly visited us during her daughter's school vacations. While I suggested alternatives, she insisted on staying, citing financial hardship. My niece, adorable and well-behaved, quickly became close to us, creating cherished summer memories at our house. As she entered middle school, the expenses began to mount with stationery, magazines, and fashion. Despite not wanting to interfere, my husband and I decided to give a generous middle school entrance gift. Touched by the thoughtful thank you letter, we looked forward to enjoying our separate vacations due to his work commitments. However, after Marine Day, my sister-in-law and niece unexpectedly arrived, announcing their month-long stay, reminiscent of previous years. I reminded her of our agreement to end these extended stays, but she brushed it off, saying, I'll just stay in the room. Entering the room confidently, my sister-in-law remarked, I've used it every year, while my niece hesitated, urged by her mother. My niece hurriedly brought their luggage, apologizing to me before settling in. My sister-in-law suggested a visit to a new nearby outlet mall, controlling the air conditioner and changing settings, expressing delight and not worrying about saving electricity while sipping on a chilled beer my husband had prepared. Frustrated, I called my husband, who couldn't leave work due to their unexpected visit. He asked me to handle his sister for the time being, promising to talk to her when he got home, even if it meant working late. Troubled by her unexpected stay, I couldn't ask him to leave work early. Reluctantly, I decided it was better to take my sister-in-law and niece to the outlet mall than to have them linger around the house. Seemingly interested, my niece nodded along with her mother's conversation, despite my reservations. I couldn't bring myself to ask her to endure it, especially considering she's my husband's relative. Unprepared for lunch and with unexpected guests, I reluctantly agreed to take them to the outlet mall. Acting for a bus due to the heat, my sister-in-law begrudgingly understood the situation. As we arrived at the outlet mall, she started fussing about forgetting her wallet. Her explanation about mistakenly putting her credit card back in her wallet didn't make sense. While I pondered her story, my niece looked momentarily disappointed but soon smiled, saying she's happy just looking around. Feeling sorry for my niece, I suggested covering today's shopping, estimating it wouldn't exceed $400 for three people. However, my sister-in-law seemed most delighted eyeing expensive items from famous brands. I ended up playing the role of her wallet, using my credit card since I didn't have enough cash, demanding repayment as soon as we got home. My sister-in-law claimed she couldn't do it right away, citing a lack of cash and a forgotten bank card. 
When I suggested using her credit card's cash advance, she claimed her credit cards had expired, blaming a mix-up with a new one. I pressed her for proof, incredulous that she had allowed her cards to expire three months ago. She explained that she had panicked and switched wallets when her old one broke, making an honest mistake. She didn't want her in-laws to know about her financial struggles, having already burdened them with the divorce. I found it challenging to be too harsh with my sister-in-law, especially since she promised to repay me. Once back at her house during that summer, she stayed with us for about a month. While my niece eagerly helped with housework and expressed interest in cooking, my sister-in-law assumed a more demanding mother-in-law-like role, questioning the delay in lunch and criticizing our approach to saving electricity. My sister-in-law never contributed to housework and complained twice as much as anyone else. With her and my niece's presence, daily chores expanded to doing laundry for four people. When I mentioned the no air conditioning rule, complaints tripled. Frustrated, I asked my sister-in-law for help in hanging the laundry. But she dismissed it, insisting that being in the sun affected her skin and demanding an expensive sunscreen brand. After a month of enduring this, my sister-in-law finally left with my niece. However, when I asked her to repay the money she owed, she refused, claiming she couldn't do it before payday. Persistent in my demands, I eventually sent a certified letter as proof. When my niece discovered her mother hadn't repaid the money, she revealed that her mother had been receiving financial support from her ex-in-laws since the divorce. My niece promised to take responsibility and repay me from the financial support her mother received. She also expressed concern about her mother's increasingly sloppy lifestyle, embarrassing her. This situation fueled my anger towards my carefree sister-in-law. With my niece approaching high school and college expenses looming, I felt compelled to teach my sister-in-law a lesson. Taking advantage of the school break, my sister-in-law and niece stayed with us again. Immediately upon arrival, my sister-in-law demanded a trip to the outlet mall, claiming she needed winter clothes. Sensing a potential repeat of her carelessness, I had already contacted some allies. After about two hours of shopping, my sister-in-law called, admitting she forgot her wallet and requested I cover the cost. Half of me thought it was typical, while the other half was exasperated. Claiming that my niece wasn't feeling well, and we had already gone home, I declined to cover her expenses. Infuriated by her carelessness regarding her daughter, I emphasized that all she had to do was admit she didn't have enough money and return the items. Why did I have to cover the expenses for her shopping? Regardless, I needed to proceed with my plan. I informed her that I would be back soon after dropping my niece off at home. She questioned the time frame, and I mentioned I had just reached a new nearby bus stop, indicating it would take another hour using public transportation. Surprisingly, she accepted this without demanding a taxi, making me suspicious that she might be up to something. She likely didn't want to risk me not coming back if she complained too much. An hour later, I arrived at the designated store with my collaborators. My sister-in-law was there, arms full of clothes and bags, instructing the staff to add more items. It seemed she planned to shop even more while awaiting my return. When I greeted her with an apology for the delay, she was surprised to see familiar faces beside me. Alongside me stood my husband, who was supposed to be at work, and then my father-in-law appeared, changing my sister-in-law's expression from surprise to confusion. She stammered, questioning why my husband was there. In truth, I had informed him about her failure to repay the money, and he was aware of everything that had transpired. He had agreed with my plan and was actually at home on a day off, hiding in the bedroom when my sister-in-law arrived. I had followed our plan and told her he was at work, and she believed me without checking. After hearing the story from my niece, my husband agreed that we should inform his parents. We reported everything, including her extended stay and refusal to repay the money. When I explained our plan for the day to my in-laws, they were furious, saying it was outrageous. 
After separating from my sister-in-law at the mall, I immediately contacted them. My husband had driven ahead and waited for us. My niece and I left my sister-in-law and went to the parking lot where my husband was waiting to drive us to a hotel to meet my in-laws. They had planned to go on a short trip to a rural area, but they prioritized our situation over their trip and waited at the hotel. I felt bad that their plans were ruined, but they insisted on dealing with my sister-in-law's antics first. As planned, we left my niece with my mother-in-law at the hotel and returned to the outlet mall. When we confronted her, my sister-in-law furiously accused me of being cheeky for someone who was just a wallet to her. However, my husband and father-in-law took away all the clothes and bags she was holding. My husband retorted, What are you doing? Don't return my clothes. They're not yours if you're not paying for them. My sister-in-law hesitated for a moment as my father-in-law returned the items to the store staff. My husband then dragged her out, and as he pulled her arm, she screamed, It hurts. Let me go. Someone help. He's attacking me. Realizing she couldn't overpower him, she started accusing my husband of being a villain. My father-in-law, who had returned from explaining to the store, pulled out something from his jacket pocket. He was, in fact, a police officer. I just happened to witness the incident, he explained, and everyone around us stopped listening to my sister-in-law's complaints. They pushed her into my husband's car parked in the lot. After reporting her actions to my in-laws, my father-in-law immediately checked her bank account. My niece knew where the passbook was, so they checked at my sister-in-law's house while she was away. The in-laws had been providing her with a monthly stipend, believing her claim of wanting to save the divorce settlement money for my niece's future. However, the entire amount was withdrawn on the day it was deposited, leaving the zero balance. The account in my niece's name, supposed to contain the divorce settlement, was almost empty because my sister-in-law didn't receive alimony due to her fault in the divorce. She also withdrew the child support from her ex-husband immediately after it was deposited. Furthermore, she confessed to not working, despite telling her parents she was. She spent her days leisurely using the support money and child support. The divorce settlement money she claimed to save for my niece was spent on her lifestyle. When it ran out, she planned to make me buy designer goods and sell them for cash. She even boasted about how well-known Target outlet items sold. My father-in-law hung his head in shame and apologized to us. Despite feeling sorry for my father-in-law, I showed them a video as evidence. It captured my sister-in-law red-handed. Whenever she and her daughter stayed with us, my husband's and my belongings mysteriously disappeared. It was too coincidental to happen every time, and more items vanished with each visit. Without proof, I couldn't accuse her, but I kept an eye on her. After she didn't repay the money I had fronted, I couldn't watch her all the time, so I installed hidden cameras in our rooms. Multiple times during her stay, she seemed to be searching our room when I was out. Finally, she began to blatantly steal. Just before leaving, there were times when she had checked the location many times and would go straight to her destination and steal what she was looking for. With practiced skill, she knew exactly where to go, swiftly taking specific items like my jewelry and my husband's luxury watch. The cameras caught her in the act, even capturing her face as she didn't notice them. My father-in-law, a police officer, was visibly furious, saying it's shameful to have a criminal in the family. He was overwhelmed with anger and sadness. When confronted, my sister-in-law brazenly claimed she had already sold the stolen items. My father-in-law instructed us to file a police report and submit the video as evidence. However, we were hesitant about turning in our own family. It's not a crime among names, right? We don't count someone who exploits kindness and repays generosity with evil as family, my husband said as he started the car engine. My sister-in-law asked, where are you taking me? My father-in-law answered, 
to the police, obviously. She screamed as if it was the end of the world, begging us for mercy. She tried to destroy my phone, claiming it would erase the evidence, but I informed her it was just a copy and the original was safe at home. She resigned to silence when she realized she had no escape. She pleaded, I'll repay the money, just don't take me to the police. It's not just a matter of getting your money back. The stolen items had sentimental value. It wasn't just about the money. My jewelry I bought with my first salary, gifts from my husband, and heirlooms from my late grandmother. The same went for my husband's luxury watch. But we worried about what would happen to my niece if her mother became a criminal. We thought my in-laws would take care of her, but it would hurt her to know her mother was a thief. So for my niece's sake, we proposed not to file a report if she kept her promise to repay us. My father-in-law agreed to ensure she kept this promise. She had to repay a set amount each month earned through her own labor. If she failed, we would immediately file a report. I told him that I had recorded the entire conversation as suggested by my father-in-law for evidence. My sister-in-law had no way to deny or forget what was said. She had no choice but to hang her head in the face of the reality that I don't know. I didn't say it. I forgot was no longer valid. Later, she was taken back to her parents' house by my father-in-law. We received an apology from my in-laws later. They admitted they have been too lenient due to their love for their granddaughter and their daughter's manipulations. They realized they had spoiled her too much and vowed to re-educate her strictly. My sister-in-law, who had always been pampered, thought it was her due. After getting engaged, she quit her job to become a housewife. Even though it was difficult to get a job again after the divorce, my sister-in-law herself confessed that she thought she was only working part-time, but in reality, she wasn't working at all. After her divorce, she didn't even attempt to work, saying she didn't want to be associated with unfashionable older women. My father-in-law, knowing she was too sheltered, arranged for her to work at a company owned by his acquaintance. The owner was strict but fair. She struggled with basic manners and language, and her salary was managed by my mother-in-law, used to repay us. My sister-in-law and her daughter moved out of the house left by her ex-husband and now live under strict supervision with her parents. My niece is becoming a more responsible person, helping her grandparents. She plans to stay with them during the winter break, but looks forward to visiting us during the spring break. My husband and I are excited for her next visit. As for my sister-in-law, regardless of any change in her, she is not welcome in our house. We both agree it's best to avoid unpleasant feelings.